Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program of surgical pathology topics is uh, part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy. We'll be using some of the materials that are available uh, in that uh, resource, uh, which is a joint venture of the Digital Pathology Association and Path Presenter. And I'm very grateful for my colleagues there at the Digital Pathology Association and Raj Singh, who founded uh, Path Presenter, uh, to be able to use these resources to prevent, present these educational materials. So today we're going to talk about uh, some vascular tumors and lesions that uh, you might encounter uh, when you're uh, doing surgical pathology and dealing with uh, that issue. Uh, so let's begin uh, and just consider that uh, in our previous episode on this topic, we talked about the benign lesions, uh, those that have uh, no metastatic or, or limited recurrent potential. And today our focus is going to be on uh, the uh, more uh, worrisome lesions that have uh, either locally aggressive or recurrent capabilities or uh, heaven forbid, metastatic potential. And so here's a listing of those kind of intermediate grade vascular lesions uh, that you might have heard. Uh, these are not uh, generally highly uh, common. Some of them are more so than others. Others are extraordinarily rare, uh, but uh, understanding what fits in the differential and uh, this category of behavior, I think uh, may help us uh, as we uh, deal with the uh, other tumors that we encounter here. So we'll begin with this lesion, the Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma. As indicated by the name, uh, this uh, looks a lot in areas like the uh, Kaposi's sarcoma uh, that we have uh, come to encounter in the uh, AIDS HIV uh, era. Now I'll mention again that if you want to follow along and look at these slides on another device, say your phone or tablet or something, uh, you can just scan the QR code here um, but uh, and do so while we, I'm talking. However, additionally, we will present uh, those uh, the links to all of these slides in the uh, description of the video uh, at the end. Now, this uh, lesion is distinct from uh, Kaposi sarcoma because it essentially affects an entirely different age group. This is generally infants and young children. And although, as you see here, it, it can have a more superficial component, it's often a deep-seated lesion and may go undetected for a period of time because of that region, the reason. Uh, of interest, this is a lesion that has a, a significant association with a, a particular microangiopathic uh, anemia type of picture, uh, specifically that uh, of the kassebach merritt syndrome, where you get thrombocytopenia, anemia, and this sort of uh, microangiopathic appearance on the blood smear with the fragmented red cells that looks uh, a lot like uh, um, the uh, hemolytic anemias of uh, just uh, various other types of uh, disorders. Uh, so let's just take a look at this uh, lesion. Here's an example uh, of uh, such a lesion. Uh, as you can see, it tends to be uh, deep uh, seated uh, and uh, has uh, a uh, nodular nested areas uh, sort of things. Uh, and you can see there's a mixture of large and small vessels, but a lot of uh, uh, smaller vessels and red cell extravasation and so forth. But you'll notice here there's very little or minimal atypia to this lesion. Um, and uh, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be something you would expect to be uh, aggressive. But as you can see, the margins are not uh, particularly sharply defined, and hence uh, the potential for recurrence is uh, relatively high. Uh, here again, you see this uh, pattern. Uh, now, another uh, lesion in this category is the Dabska tumor, so-called uh, papillary intralymphatic angioendothelioma. This is a, a fairly rare lesion, and I could not find an example in our uh, slide library, uh, nor in the DAPA library as of yet. So perhaps some of my uh, derm path or soft tissue uh, path uh, people uh, who are involved there can uh, find us a, an example. Uh, but if we go to look at what's been published in the literature, uh, this lesion has, as you see, a, a papillary intravascular type of proliferation with a lot of these kind of hobnail cells, uh, uh, really plump protruding uh, endothelial cells that you can see here. 
Um, and uh, this again is a lesion that typically presents in infants uh, and has some association um, in, a, in, in that, but oftentimes it, it is in adults as well. So up to 40% can be adults. Uh, this can again be superficial or deep, um, but uh, usually it's dermal. Now, uh, sometimes we'll see some associated lymphocytes associated with these little tufted uh, lesions, but not always. Um, and because of this sort of appearance, sometimes you're, you're concerned for uh, redeform hemangioendothelioma or angiosarcoma with uh, papillary features and so forth. Um, and so here you can see this, this vessel with these papillary projections all along the uh, course of the vessel. Uh, and that's from uh, Julie Fanberg Smith's uh, publication from 1999. So you see we're going back a ways to, to pick this lesion up. This was a classic publication. So another lesion that encounter or it comes to bear in this uh, category of things with intermediate uh, differentiation is the redeform hemangioendothelioma. Now this can present at virtually any age, uh, but usually is uh, more common in the adolescents and young adults. Uh, most commonly it's in the lower extremities, but uh, other sites have been reported as well. Uh, and usually it's dermal subcutaneous uh, type of location. It's called the rediform because as you can see, it has these very nice cleft-like uh, vascular spaces here that sort of recapitulate the reedy testis. Um, we can take a look at uh, this particular slide, which I uh, used for my uh, target slide. And you can see here better the margin. This has some sense of uh, demarcation. And as you can see, is forming a, an exophytic nodule uh, with some secondary uh, squamous epithelial hyperplasia and hyperkeratosis. Uh, when we come in on higher magnification on this lesion, again, you see these rather plump, almost uh, hobnail type of endothelial cells that uh, form vessels around and uh, scaffolding on the uh, collagen of the uh, dermis. Uh, when they extend in and involve the fat, you can see they dissect between and around fatty lobules uh, in this uh, manner. But although this looks a little bit worrisome, these really are quite monot monotonous. Uh, the nucleoli are inconspicuous or absent. Uh, and we don't see any evidence of mitotic activity in this lesion. Uh, now, not all lesions are as uh, circumscribed as this one appears to be. Um, and in fact, uh, we may have some of this lesion over here, as you can see. So it's really not quite as well-defined as it uh, might appear superficially. And so not surprisingly, this uh, lesion does have a fairly high uh, risk of local recurrence. Uh, metastases are very uncommon, but not unheard of. Uh, but because of the local recurrence and so forth, this can become a lesion which eventually results in the need for amputation or more serious uh, surgery. Uh, now, we talked a little bit about these hobnail hemangiomas in the earlier lecture, uh, but now we've uh, got uh, two additional lesions, the reform hemangioendothelioma we just talked about, the Dabska tumor, hobnail hemangioma, and uh, for completeness, we put in the post-irradiation atypical vascular lesion just to compare and contrast uh, the findings. So uh, young adults, uh, any of these lesions can occur in young adults. Uh, the Dabska tumor more common in infants and children. Uh, extremities for redeform hemangioendothelioma versus uh, trunk more common, and the Dabska tumor just about anywhere. Uh, most of these are dermis, subcutaneous tissues, so not a high degree of differentiation there. Um, the hobnail hemangioma, as you'll recall, has dilated superficial vessels, and then as it de goes deeper into the dermis, the vessels appear more compressed. Whereas the Dabska tumors tend to be a little bit more cavernous, lymphangioma-like, and then they have these intraluminal papillae uh, and of course, we just looked at the anastomosing channels and the rediform hemangioendothelial cells. Uh, any of them can have hobnail cells. And uh, intraluminal papillae are occasionally seen in se several of these lesions. Um, 
the Dabska tumor may have an uh, associated lymphoid or lymphatic malformation. Uh, now, the uh, lymphoid infiltrate can be uh, seen in several of these lesions. We didn't see it in our uh, incident case that we looked at, uh, but this can also have hemosiderin. Uh, and then, as you'll notice, the margins um, a little bit more uh, symmetric or wedge-shaped with a hobnail hemangioma, but more ill-defined or infiltrative with the other uh, two principal lesions we're talking about here. So I'll go on to the composite hemangioendothelioma. This lesion, again, is quite rare. I could only find uh, one example. Um, uh, and uh, by virtue of the name, you might suspect that uh, this is a lesion that has different morphologies. And that's kind of what this image here is trying to show you, that you can have areas that look more uh, solid or uh, epithelioid appearing, uh, some areas where you may have a little bit more redeformed type of architecture, or other areas that uh, may be look a little bit more like an epithelioid hemangioendothelioma or something of that type. So we'll take a look at this slide and we can just get an idea of kind of the types of things that we're going to see. So here we see a little bit more uh, spindle cell area. Uh, we've got a lot of these spindle shaped cells, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, epithelioid appearance in some areas. Uh, but if you just had this, you might be thinking you know, spindle cell angiosarcoma or spindle cell hemangioma or something of that sort. Uh, and then uh, we look over here and we see more myxoid areas, a little bit more of that uh, rediform appearance uh, in some areas here. Um, and so that composition or that mixture of uh, lesions uh, that uh, you might uh, see here, a little bit more uh, cavernous uh, type of uh, uh, vessels uh, here, as well as the more myxoid small vessels surrounding that, uh, would give you maybe the thought that this is a multiphasic type of tumor, and that might lead you to the diagnosis of the composite hemangioendothelioma. If you see one, certainly you should share it. They're not very common, and uh, as a consequence, we don't know completely what the behavior uh, of these lesions is going to be. Uh, because there's just not a lot of cases out there in the literature. Now, also in this category is a, a distinctive lesion, the pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. Now, why is it called pseudomyogenic? Well, the reason is because uh, many of these cells will resemble uh, rhabdomyoblasts or rhabdoid cells, uh, even though they will be positive with uh, endothelial type markers. Uh, and the other distinctive feature about this is that it tends to involve multiple tissue planes. Um, these usually occur in the limb. Um, and again, they're usually kind of young adults or early adulthood types of lesions. But in addition to involving the skin, such as we see here, they may involve uh, muscle and even bone uh, in the same limb. Uh, in a somewhat unusual uh, manner. Uh, the other distinctive feature about this is that these are uh, negative for CD34, and some are even negative for CD31. Uh, however, they do stain, uh, do mark with the uh, vascular markers uh, ERG and FLY1. Uh, of interest, they also have a uh, pan-CK uh, possibility for being positive as well. So they're quite a distinctive uh, uh, immunoprofile there. Uh, this is uh, associated with a balanced translocation uh, between uh, two genes you don't frequently encounter. One is FOSB, the other is serpine 1. Um, and so that uh, translocation, if you have the capability to do a marker for that, could uh, be useful. Um, so here's uh, the uh, slide we've uh, used for our example. Uh, and you can see here is the cutaneous uh, uh, elements. You see it has this, uh, doesn't really jump out at you <clears throat> as a vascular tumor. Um, and so you might be thinking, well, strap cells or whatever, uh, maybe this is a myogenic tumor or something of that sort. Um, but what is helpful here is that there are some of these cells that have little uh, vacuoles or lumina type formation. If you look closely in some of these areas, uh, and so you might get a clue uh, from that type of morphology to think, oh, could this be a vascular tumor? Even though you have 
you know, more well-defined vessels kind of in the background. Now you'll note that there is a degree of atypia here in these uh, in this lesion as well, uh, and so uh, uh, that uh, comes into the differential uh, of a potential malignancy or at least a local recurrent recurrence of a type of lesion. Notice here that it infiltrates around the adnexal structures, um, and uh, again we can see this uh, mild pleomorphism, some strap myogenic-like cells with occasional cells with uh, little uh, intracytoplasmic lumina or vacuolar change uh, that might uh, lead you to suggest a possible uh, vascularity. So again, uh, because the, uh, of the possibility of uh, negative uh, staining with your more commonly available uh, uh, markers, uh, this is one that requires a bit of familiarity and a high degree of suspicion uh, but particularly if you see any degree of involvement of multiple tissue planes um, in a younger person, uh, think about that possibility uh, that this is the lesion that you're working with, a pseudomyogenic uh, hemangioendothelioma. Oh, that's the same, uh, same lesion, same slide, so we'll go forward. Now, coming to something that uh, maybe you do see or will see uh, in, your, uh, in your career, uh, the Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, this is a lesion that uh, has a long history, uh, originally thought to be more endemic in the uh, elderly Mediterranean population, uh, but uh, with the onset of the AIDS and HIV uh, uh, pandemic, uh, this became a much more frequently encountered and recognized uh, lesion. Um, the uh, Clinical history on this, of course, goes back a ways. The more common morphologic features that we might see are these first three, uh, sort of a patch stage where you just have a little bit of an erythematous uh, process, uh, and then maybe a plaque, a little more indurated, larger lesion that ultimately can then form uh, nodules. But there are other patterns that have been recognized. Uh, including, uh, you know, keloidals and cavernous and so forth. There is also a lymphadenopathic uh, morphology that is uh, distinctive uh, and uh, manifest uh, in uh, patients with uh, HIV AIDS. Um, in terms of sites, uh, obviously the most uh, frequently encountered site is the skin, uh, but with the AIDS pandemic, we began to recognize that this could occur in mucocutaneous sites as well, the GI tract, tracheobronchial tree lymph nodes, and occasionally other sites uh, as well. Uh, there are uh, several uh, classical uh, presentations of this. Um, and in fact, the scenarios that are associated with this uh, sort of fall into several different camps. So there is this classic uh, scenario where it's an elderly Mediterranean origin person, uh, and it tends to be lower extremities, uh, sort of an indolent disease. Uh, there's also an African endemic uh, variant of this uh, disorder. Uh, which is uh, uh, somewhat similar, but may have more aggressive and may be more frequently associated with the some of the uh, uh, entero uh, uh, GI tract, tracheal, bronchial tree type of locations. Uh, we also see it in other immunocompromised patients, such as uh, in which case we would term it more the iatrogenic uh, uh, scenario. Uh, and then there's the epidemic uh, scenario where it's uh, occurring in HIV AIDS uh, patients. Uh, and again, this is uh, highly associated with uh, uh, the CD4 counts. Once you uh, manage that, uh, uh, restore some degree of immunocompetence, they don't have trouble with this. Now, of course, the reason for this uh, lesion, the reason this is associated with uh, uh, HIV AIDS is that this is actually an infectious uh, disorder. Uh, even though we classify it as a malignancy, many of these are, especially in the uh, HIV AIDS patients, are uh, polyclonal uh, in multiple sites and so forth, and are uh, have been demonstrated to be associated with human herpes virus 8. Now, that's also the case with uh, the more classical uh, presentations and so forth, uh, but uh, in an immunocompromised patient, it has a, a more serious uh, prognosis. So let's take a look at some of these lesions. Here's a, an early patch stage type of lesion. Uh, as you can see, just a little bit of erythema, some extravasated red cells, 
and a little bit of kind of delicate vasculature kind of building out on the uh, uh, dermal collagen here. Not very atypical. Uh, maybe some of these are endothelial cells, a lot of slit-like spaces here, uh, but certainly not a lot of uh, endothelial proliferation, uh, just a mild degree uh, here, and then a lot of the extravasated red cells. Here's another example where we may be getting into the more nodular stage, uh, and here you see more classical spindle-shaped cells. Uh, notice that there's some lymphocytes associated with this, uh, and we don't really define good uh, endothelial spaces, but we do see these uh, sort of lined up extravasated red cells, sometimes uh, thought of as sort of boxcar-like or railroad car-like uh, arrays of these uh, red cells along a line such as you see here. Here is another example, slowly loading. Well, maybe we'll just skip over this one. Uh, here's a more nodular exophytic uh, lesion, sort of a pyogenic granuloma-like uh, lesion. But as you can see here, in contrast to the lobular capillary hemangioma, this is very cellular. You've got a lot of spindle-shaped cells. You've got a lot more red cells involved. You see these cytoplasmic vacuoles. You see the boxcar red cell nuclei streaming along in some of these uh, areas like this and so forth. Uh, so a uh, high degree of suspicion that this is a vascular neoplasm. And you've got some associated uh, other ectatic blood vessels as well uh, in this area. Here's another nodular stage lesion, uh, rounded sort of desmoplastic stroma, some feeder vessels, and again, this uh, spindle-shaped cell uh, pattern with lots of red cells uh, in between and between uh, the cells within the vessels. Uh, here, more of a patch stage uh, type of pattern <clears throat> where you've got a little bit of induration over a broad area, uh, some normal intervening tissue, and then these uh, little more telangiectatic type vessels. Not as many red cells, but some. You can clearly see there's a, a red cell component to uh, what's going on here. Uh, as well. And note the very low degree of atypia. Uh, and this is, of course, why you might uh, run into the uh, Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma in your differential, uh, but the uh, age group and so forth would help you uh, with that. And then another uh, example, uh, just to get the, the variety and spectrum of disease, here seeming to follow the existing vascular plexuses uh, in your superficial vascular plexus, but Note the uh, little scaffolding array here with uh, delicate flattened uh, endothelial cells here. Again, the exophytic uh, uh, pseudo capillary hemangioma type of pattern, uh, low magnification. Uh, and then, not to be forgotten, uh, these lesions can present uh, and involve the uh, GI tract, and here's one where you see just a few of these spindle-shaped cells here in the stroma um, with some extravasated red cells. So it can be subtle. Um, of course, if you have the history uh, of uh, you know, HIV AIDS or something, you may be able to clue in on this more quickly and jump right to the HHV-8 uh, immunostain to uh, verify and uh, solidify your diagnosis. Uh, another example, this one from the rectum, um, a little bit more subtle, uh, as you see here, just a little bit of hypercellularity between the glands, almost looks like a hyperplastic polyp. Um, and so if you were just uh, rushing through this and just looking at the epithelium, you might miss the fact that we have this uh, stromal vascular proliferation uh, going on as well. So uh, let's just talk about the differential between these uh, lesions, the Kaposi sarcoma, at least in the nodular stage, the hemangioendothelioma that's Kaposiform, and the tufted angioma that we talked about earlier. Uh, so somewhat different age groups, uh, Kaposi's in uh, adults, uh, especially older adults for the more classic forms, uh, either of these other two lesions in children. Uh, distal extremities, more classical, 
uh, but may be present on the trunk and elsewhere in the uh, epidemic forms. Compulsive forms of mangioendothelioma is typically uh, retroperitoneum, then extremities uh, more frequently than other sites. Uh, this one may, of course, be associated with the uh, Kasebeck Merritt syndrome. Uh, these others would not be. Tufted angioma tends to be upper trunk uh, and extremities does not have a retroperitoneal uh, incidence. Uh, locations, these tend to be deeper um, and there is uh, infrequent subcutaneous extension for this one, the tufted angioma. Uh, spindle cells are prominent in the <coughs> Kaposi sarcoma and the Kaposi form angioendothelioma, but uh, exceedingly rare in the tufted angiomas. Uh, these spaces are rounded, the rest are slit-like, um, and lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. We've noticed some of that in a few areas. Glomeruloid clusters can be seen in this one, and uh, dilated crescentic lymphatics at the periphery of the lobules. We did point that out when we reviewed that uh, case earlier uh, with the earlier uh, uh, video. All right, well, that, well, let's move on to the bad guys, the ones that really can kill you, disseminate, uh, present with a bad prognosis and uh, widely disseminated disease. Uh, these would include the epithelioid hemangioendothelioma, uh, angiosarcoma, epithelioid angiosarcoma, and spindle cell angiosarcoma. So essentially, these are just, um, these are all pretty much the same prognosis, just different morphologies, uh, and this one, has a somewhat different name and uh, prognosis and presentation. So epithelioid hemangioendothelioma is uh, a uh, disorder that uh, can present in multiple sites. Uh, it can involve uh, bone, liver, soft tissue, uh, and even some other uh, soft tissue organs and so forth. Uh, so let's uh, uh, go on and take a look at some of the differential features for this lesion. So uh, here's uh, an example. Uh, notice here again, we have some uh, uh, lymphoid infiltrate around the periphery, and we can see it has an endothelial, uh, endothelioma type pattern. Uh, here we've got quite a bit of hemosiderin deposition in the stroma, and we see these very plump uh, interconnecting uh, channels of vascular cells with really quite an epithelioid appearance to the endothelial cells. So hence its name, um, and uh, we'll go on and take a look at another example, uh, this one from the skin. Um, now let's make sure I'm looking at the right spot here. And I think I'm not, I think this is where I wanna be is over here. So here again, we see nice plump endothelioid and epithelioid type cells. Uh, the channeling and the uh, vasculature of it is not quite as uh, evident, but they're uh, fairly, uh, fairly plump cells uh, and maybe a few uh, vascular type spaces associated with it. So cutaneous, uh, deep tissue locations. Uh, here's another one from the skin. Uh, this one with a little bit more uh, vacuolated appearance, uh, sort of a pseudo lipogenic type pattern. Um, but this would not stain with uh, the uh, uh, and with the uh, fatty markers. Uh, these are the uh, little endothelial type pseudolumina uh, of these uh, endothelial spaces. And notice here at the periphery, we have the other features that say, I'm a vascular tumor, not just a lipogenic tumor. You've got these plump uh, little papillary areas and even some hobnail type cells uh, in these uh, vessels here. So uh, very epithelioid component with uh, other uh, morphologies as well. Uh, here's one in uh, bone. Uh, as you can see, the uh, lamellar bone here, uh, some expansion and destruction of that. And then looking inside here, we see there's this uh, uh, plump uh, endothelial pattern with a fair degree of atypia in some of these areas. Um, and of course, in bone, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish you know, what are atypical osteoblasts as opposed to what are endothelial cells. Uh, and clearly the differential here would include, you know, a, uh, a low-grade intraosseous osteosarcoma or other uh, primary bone lesions. 
even possibly, uh, you know, chronic uh, osteomyelitis might be included in the differential. But notice all the extravasated red cells here that sort of give you the clue that this may be a vascular type of uh, lesion. Some thin walled vessels and some connectivity of these atypical cells to these uh, vascular structures. And then here's one in the liver um, with a, a different morphology. You can see this looks very almost granulomatous uh, appearance. And you'd look at this and go, these are vessels. But yes, if you look closely, there are a few red cells in some of these uh, atypical cell lesions. Um, and it's got a lot of this hyaline pink material in between. Um, a very distinctive and uh, unusual appearance. Uh, obviously not granulomatous disease, but sort of a uh, multi-nodular uh, type of a pattern and proliferation uh, with some intervening lymphocytes. So where are we going to put these lesions? Well, here's another bone lesion. We'll just go back onto this as well, just to show you the more cellular areas, uh, which give you a more characteristic, uh, again, sort of areas of pseudolipogenic appearance, but also uh, a lot of these epithelioid uh, type cells. There's that liver again. We won't go through that. More bone. So. Um, the different sites where this can occur and presentations uh, can be quite uh, helpful uh, and are also significant in terms of prognosis. Because as you look down here at the bottom line, if you're getting this in the lung or liver, uh, your likelihood of developing uh, or dying from the disease is uh, almost 50% as opposed to whether it's in your bone or just soft tissue. Uh, and that's because your metastatic rate is much more likely, and these tend to be multifocal. Um, in the bone, they also tend to be multifocal. And uh, at times, the, the multifocality can be multiple different sites and different tissues, not just multifocal within a single organ system. Um, age range, um, a little different, higher in the liver, a little younger in the lung, a little younger in bone. Soft tissue, about the same. Females, a little bit more likely to be uh, involved with uh, lung and liver disease. So uh, a few di distinctions there, but in truth, uh, there's, these, are, these distinctions are not going to make the, the difference to you in terms of diagnosis, but certainly in terms of clinical parameters and uh, workup and uh, likelihood of uh, the prognosis, uh, they're useful to, to know. All right, so let's go on to uh, the, the big uh, elephant in the room, the angiosarcoma. And I've chosen here for our incident uh, photograph uh, a, a low-grade appearing lesion. Uh, this is actually one, as you can surmise here, from the breast, a few little breast ductules here. Um, and it doesn't look very impressive, does it? Uh, and that's because this is the sobering story. Uh, I remember one very notable uh, frozen section misdiagnosis when I was a trainee and it involved this lesion. Uh, clinically, there was a lesion. We froze it. Uh, we didn't uh, hone in on the, the uh, vascular proliferation uh, because it looked very innocuous and, of course, frozen section artifact and so forth. And so we did not get the diagnosis um, at that time. Uh, we got it on fi uh, final exam, but uh, that was a little bit, a uh, little while later. So this is a lesion that can present in uh, the elderly patients, uh, sometimes fairly ill-defined, as you can see here on the face. Uh, in the breast, likewise, it can be just kind of an area of induration. Um, and on the face, you can have a variety of uh, morphologies. You can have these more solid areas, almost epithelioid here in the skin of the face uh, with some areas of necrosis, some uh, ectatic vessels. I believe we've got some of those down here a little deeper. Well, I'm not seeing right off, but a, a more solid type of lesion um, and just a very few subtle hints that this is a vascular lesion. Uh, it, we can also see sort of nodular areas like this where we get some more, again, more spindle-shaped cells, uh, nodular appearing uh, type of morphology. This might be classified as the spindle cell uh, angiosarcoma, um, but it also has a, a few more epithelioid areas as well, uh, as you see here. Um, in uh, the liver, 
Uh, they can also present as a more spindle cell proliferation. And here's one again that doesn't look very vascular. Uh, it's not even highly anaplastic. It's uh, certainly got some pleomorphism here, uh, but you might think, well, this is just some sort of a mesenchymal neoplasm um, because the vessel, the vascular nature of it is not uh, jumping out uh, to uh, inform you of its uh, histo histogenesis. Another example from the skin, uh, this one a little bit more circumscribed. Uh, and uh, here we note there is a, a fair bit of uh, inflammatory infiltrate. We can see a mixture of vessels and epithelial type cells and scaffolding around uh, and uh, to some degree displacing the adnexal structures, as you can see here. Again, note the uh, little bubble like spaces. Uh, Again, suggesting here's one with a nice little red cell right in the middle. That little target says, think vascular lesion. Um, and so you get to the diagnosis of uh, angiosarcoma. Uh, here's another uh, cutaneous lesion, uh, some inflammatory post biopsy changes here. Uh, and then over here, uh, you can see this very uh, uh, cavernous, uh, angiectatic uh, appearance uh, of the lesion uh, that uh, builds upon the collagen scaffolding. And in this case, has very little in terms of endothelial atypia. It's just the pattern of uh, destructive growth that gives away its uh, uh, biologic uh, potential as a uh, malignant lesion. Now, as I've mentioned, in the breast, uh, these lesions can occur and be very subtle. Uh, so here's a low power magnification, and you can see it doesn't look overly uh, remarkable, but as you begin to come into higher magnification, you see that there's all of these vascular channels. Uh, and these channels sort of dissect around and involve uh, breast ductal tissue uh, around breast lobules, as you can see here. Uh, but notice here in the breast that uh, the atypia, uh, the layering of these endothelial cells is uh, pretty pretty modest. There's not a lot of atypia, a little bit of perpendicular hobnail type forming, a little bit of the layering of the endothelial cells, uh, but not very prominent. Uh, but uh, the benign vascular lesions do not uh, infiltrate and destroy uh, breast parenchyma. They don't infiltrate around the breast uh, structures. They tend to displace them. Um, and uh, that's also true with the uh, uh, atypical uh, post irradiation lesions uh, as well. They don't have this infiltrative and destructive uh, capability. Uh, here's another lesion, again, in the soft tissue. Uh, and I think you can see here there's a little bit more solid tissue. Again, not very uh, vasoformative. Uh, just a little suggestion that there's a vasculature component to this. Um, but as you go through here, you can see there are some vessels and they begin to see some atypia in this component. Uh, and again, the extravasated red cells will be a clue. Uh, again, it's infiltrating around and amongst the uh, benign breast elements, uh, and so it helps to it helps you to make that diagnosis here as well. You see it over here. Well, not quite exactly there. Okay, um, I think we'll skip that slide. This uh, is a lesion that can result from uh, consistent lymphedema. This is a risk factor uh, if you have. Uh, Filariasis or other lymph destroying lymphatic channel destructive lesions, you can develop secondary uh, angiosarcomas. That's true also post mastectomy. Um, and uh, that can happen either due to the radiation or to the uh, um, lymphatic obstruction that leads to chronic congestion, inflammation, and uh, development of that lesion. So this is an example of a post irradiation angiosarcoma. As you can see, it's pretty subtle. 
Uh, not a lot of atypia here, but there's some. Uh, and of course, we know that vasculature or is uh, altered by radiation. You get sort of smudgy nuclei. But here you're getting a higher degree of atypia. Uh, and if it was coupled with an infiltrative character, uh, as we are suggested to see here, uh, then you could make the diagnosis of post radiation sarcoma. Well, and uh, the, the other entity, we've talked a little bit about epithelioid morphology, so let's talk about epithelioid angiosarcoma as a specific uh, subtype. Uh, and this is when the epithelioid morphology is the predominant uh, component of the tumor. Now, there's a few spindle shaped cells here, but the majority of the lesion is epithelioid. Uh, this morphology is more common in the soft tissues, uh, the deeper soft tissues, as opposed to the skin. Uh, also common in the adrenal or thyroid, but is very uncommon in the breast uh, or superficial uh, skin. Uh, now of interest, uh, these lesions often will be uh, CK or EMA positive, um, but uh, cytokeratin uh, EMA can be positive in some conventional angiosarcomas as well. Not uh, greater than half, but uh, it's not sufficiently discriminant to uh, make the diagnosis. Uh, now, of course, you're also probably going to be considering things like epithelioid sarcoma in the differential. Uh, and fortunately, these lesions are nicely positive with the majority of your uh, endothelial markers. Um, these tend to be a little bit more frequent in males and uh, usually are much older patients. Uh, they spread to nodal or solid organ sites at an early stage of disease. Uh, obviously, with access to the vasculature, uh, they can go wherever the blood goes, you think, yeah. Uh, so we mentioned this, uh, the differential diagnosis would include melanoma, uh, an epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, carcinomas, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, uh, and epithelioid sarcoma and mesothelioma. Depending on the site at which they're occurring, uh, these may enter into your differential. So just to take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, well, here's the cutaneous uh, example, uh, gross uh, image, multiple nodules. As you can see, they have a tendency to ulcerate. So here's uh, a uh, lesion that is, uh, I think if you'll uh, look here to the uh, periphery, you'll see there's uh, some smooth muscle type tissue here. Um, and here's our lesion, a bit of associated lymphocytes and you can see very epithelioid appearing cells, very high grade, uh, and a few areas that give away their vascular uh, predilection. Um, but that's a minority. The majority of the lesion is this more solid epithelioid appearing tumor. And so giving it the moniker of uh, epithelioid angiosarcoma is uh, the best name for this. Now, the name doesn't have a high degree of uh, prognostic significance, and so uh, if you fail to call it uh, epithelioid angiosarcoma, you're only making it harder if there's a subsequent biopsy, but you're not changing the prognosis appreciably for the patient. Uh, here's another lesion, this one in the, in the skin, where it's a little bit less common, uh, but again, you can see uh, very epithelioid appearing cells, a lot of abundant pink cytoplasm, uh, a little suggestion of vascular uh, nature, uh, some hemosiderin and so forth, uh, but very uh, epithelial appearing with very prominent nucleoli uh, in this location. So uh, the last entity we'll touch on uh, is the spindle cell angiosarcoma. And as you can see, I had to borrow a picture from web pathology to illustrate this, as you can see, the prominent uh, spindle cell component. Uh, these tend to be generally short fascicles with slit-like spaces. They have a very high mitotic rate, and they'll have the cytoplasmic vacuoles that we've talked about, uh, including on in other, in other portions of this presentation. Oftentimes, these will have well-formed vessels at the periphery uh, with uh, sort of uh, atypical endothelial cells that sort of give it away as being contiguous from that. Uh, there's definitely more atypia, more pleomorphism, more uh, nu nuclear abnormality than in Kaposi sarcoma, but in terms of prognosis, uh, no appreciable dif difficulties. 
Now, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gardner, has done a video on this topic, and I uh, put the link here, uh, which uh, just to remind you to go look for that if you want to learn more about this particular variant of angiosarcoma. Well, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Just to summarize, uh, there are some malignant vascular tumors. They're relatively uncommon. Um, they generally fall into that category of angiosarcomas, though you would do want to think about the epithelioid hemangioendotheliomas as being malignant. We don't grade these, these lesions. They all do poorly, um, and so don't waste a lot of time in that regard. But do understand the clinical presentations and where they can be different and uh, arise differently. Uh, for contrast, of course, I would refer you back to the benign uh, lesions that we uh, highlighted on the earlier video. So thank you so much for joining me and uh, watching uh, this lesion, uh, this uh, talk. Uh, I'd welcome your comments. You can reach out to me directly or leave comments in the video uh, uh, space. And if you like this, you know, hit that subscribe button and share it uh, uh, because uh, that's how we get the word out and how uh, we can uh, share this uh, understanding. And of course, we also welcome you to join the DPA and jo uh, get the uh, advantages of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy materials, which are really, really a rich resource. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.